Today's lesson looks at the impact of Christianity throughout period 4, which runs from about 1450 to 1750 CE. This date range coincides with the Renaissance era and with the age of European exploration, both of which we've already covered in class. As you'll soon learn, it also encompasses the era of reform within the Western Christian Church, and then the spread of the various Christian denominations around the world. So, how did this expansion start? Let's start with the beginning of the era. The age of the Renaissance did more than just promote a new philosophy, that's humanism, for scholars and artists. It also brought up, once again, the issue of corruption within the Christian Church, especially in the West. Once the Roman Catholic Church, the RCC, had split definitively from the Eastern Orthodox Church, it was able to continue building its church hierarchy. In fact, the RCC quickly became a bureaucracy, with numerous clergy members filling thousands of roles within the papal government. Since this government was situated in Italy, except for a relatively brief period in the late 14th century, many of these bureaucratic roles were filled with Italians. Throughout the late Middle Ages, there were various calls for reform of the church and of its hierarchy. Most of these calls came from outside of Italy, places like England and Bohemia. While these early reformers had their devoted followers, there was no real reform made to the church itself. As the 15th century rolled around, the papal court, just like other wealthy courts in northern and central Italy, had embraced the Renaissance and had begun patronizing artists and authors. By the turn of the 16th century, Rome was being rebuilt along Renaissance ideals, which meant that much of the church's money was devoted to this effort. It was during this time that the new St. Peter's Basilica and the new Apostolic Palace, with its famous Sistine Chapel decorated by Michelangelo, were built. These efforts absolutely celebrated the genius and God-given talents of many artists. But they also raised questions about precisely how the church should be spending its money, and whether focusing on the refurbishment of Rome was really to the benefit of all of the Roman Catholic Church. Martin Luther was the man whose questions would ultimately bring about the fracturing of the Roman Catholic Church in Western Europe. Luther, a monk and professor of theology, had long questioned the hierarchy of the church, and, as he'd studied for his doctorate, he began to question certain beliefs of the church as well. In 1517, he published some of his questions and critiques of the church in a document that has come to be known as the 95 Theses. For the most part, the document argued that not only was the practice of indulgences wrong, but that the monies paid to the church for these indulgences did not stay in the diocese in which they were raised, but instead went straight to Rome. So what is an indulgence? Well, the practice of granting indulgences had developed in the Middle Ages. An indulgence is the remittance of the punishment for a sin. In practice, a Catholic can confess their sins to a priest, and that priest can then forgive these sins in the name of God, provided that the sinner demonstrates true repentance. As a way to prove this repentance, the priest often assigns a penance, an act or set of acts that the Catholic performs. In the present time, in the modern day, most priests set penance through prayer. The Catholic is asked to recite a prayer, such as the rosary, as penance. In the Middle Ages, it was more common for penance to be both longer and more intense. Catholics might be asked to fast for a certain period of time or to wear clothing which denoted their sin. For example, they might shave their heads or wear sackcloth, etc. One idea that developed was that a Catholic could perform an outstanding act, such as going on a difficult or dangerous pilgrimage, which could itself count as an indulgence. Catholics who went on pilgrimage were given an indulgence by a priest upon completion of that pilgrimage, and this indulgence meant that the pilgrimage itself served as penance for sins both confessed and unconfessed. What you see on screen here is the famous Santiago de Compostela, one of the most remarkable and famous pilgrimage sites in all of Western Europe. Uh, during the time of the Crusades, the popes had said that taking up the cross, i.e. going on crusade, was itself an indulgence. Uh, this was done to encourage soldiers to go on crusade. You know, it's a pretty neat deal. It was like saying, hey, when you go on crusade, you're definitely going to kill people, and that sin of murder will be forgiven because, hey, indulgence. Now, during the Renaissance period, the concept of the indulgence was further corrupted. 
Itinerant preachers traveled the countryside and sold indulgences. They literally carried menus which listed sins and then the price of an indulgence for that sin. Unlike a traditional indulgence, there was no act of penance beyond the payment for the indulgence. In fact, a sinner wouldn't even have to confess, just pay up. It was this practice which Luther found so horrific. As you might imagine, though, the Roman Catholic Church wasn't very sympathetic to Luther's critiques, and Luther wasn't willing to back down. Luther had also come to question exactly how one achieved salvation. Luther believed that one was saved through faith alone, through the sincere belief in God and in Jesus as the Son of God, while the Roman Catholic Church thought that it was a combination of faith and good works, good deeds, especially through the sacraments, that allowed a person to earn salvation. In the end, the Roman Catholic Church excommunicated Luther, which then forced Luther to establish his own Reformed Church. Luther and his followers, found mostly in the German states and in Scandinavia, eventually rejected some of the elements of the Roman Catholic Church's teachings. For Lutherans, there was no strict church hierarchy, and the clergy could marry. They also believed that the Bible had to be translated into vernacular languages so that people had access to the Word of God. As the 16th century progressed, there were more reformers interested in redefining what it meant to be a Christian. The original reform movement split into multiple parts as a result of these competing ideas. One of the most popular of these new reformers was a French priest by the name of Jean Calvin, who agreed with Luther that the Roman Catholic Church was wrong in its understanding of God's word, but then disagreed with Luther as to what that understanding should be. Unlike Catholics and Lutherans, Calvin believed that the Bible should be understood literally, and that only those elements of belief which explicitly appeared in the Bible should be taught. Accordingly, Calvin published the Institutes of the Christian Religion in 1536, which outlined his strict version of Christianity. One of the unique aspects of Calvin's teachings was the belief in predestination, which Calvin took from the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. In that text, the narrator comments on the number of people he saw who had achieved salvation. Catholics and Lutherans had always taken this number symbolically. They believed it simply meant to indicate a relatively large number of people were saved. Calvin, of course, took the number literally, and therefore decided that this meant that God had already decided who was going to be saved and who was going to be damned to hell and that the people who were going to be damned could do nothing to change their fate. Those who were going to be saved would show indications of this salvation throughout their lives. They would, for example, be attracted to Calvinism, and they would be blessed with gifts from God, like success in business or large, happy, healthy families. The saved were known as the elect, or the living saints. On this map, you can see the extent to which the Protestant Reformation had spread across Europe in the 16th century. As is clearly evidenced, the vast majority of Europe remained largely Catholic. This is especially true of states that bordered the Mediterranean. Unsurprisingly, the northern German states, home to Martin Luther, converted to Luther's Reformed theology, while Calvinism mostly spread in pockets, from parts of France, where John Calvin was born, to areas in Switzerland, and to the Dutch Republic, and then eventually to Scotland. By the 1530s, this precedent of reforming the Christian Church, what we call the Protestant Reformation, was well established in Western Europe. For the most part, the Reformation was a grassroots affair, with congregations pushing for reform. In England, however, the Protestant Reformation was a top-down decision. King Henry VIII, who had been married to his wife, Catherine, for about 20 years, was increasingly concerned with his lack of a male heir. He did have one daughter whom he loved very much. Her name was Mary. Henry tried to get an annulment from the Pope so that he could remarry someone younger, but the Pope would not grant him the annulment. As a result, Henry's advisors, some of whom were attracted to the reform movement, suggested to Henry that he could divorce England from the Catholic Church and then divorce his wife and remarry. And that's exactly what happened. 
In 1534, an act of Parliament created the Church of England, which is also known as the Anglican Church. This move meant that England joined the Protestant Reformation. That said, the actual reform in England, at least during this time, was almost non-existent. Basically, Henry's Anglicanism was a compromise between Catholicism and Lutheranism. Perhaps because, at least initially, a majority of English citizens resented the creation of the Church of England. There was a group of English reformers who were disappointed that the Church of England had not embraced the more strict reform of Calvinism. These reformers came to be known as Puritans, and for the next 100 years or so, they would attempt to impose their version of Christianity on all of England. While successful for a very brief time in the 17th century, the Puritans were mostly persecuted by the English government. Inevitably, the Roman Catholic Church would respond to the critiques of the Protestant reformers with their own set of reforms. Known as the Counter or Catholic Reformation, these reforms were decided upon during a set of meetings first organized by Pope Paul III. For the most part, the Catholic clergy who participated in the Council of Trent reaffirmed the various beliefs of the Catholic Church which were criticized by the reformers. For example, they insisted that both faith and good works were necessary for salvation, and that predestination did not exist, and that the Bible should be interpreted, not read literally. However, there were reforms. Among those reforms were those of indulgences, which could no longer be sold, only earned, and education. Both Luther and Calvin had criticized the fact that some priests couldn't even read the text they were supposed to use to explain things to their congregations. So the church reforms pushed education, both for the clergy and for the laity. New religious orders, such as the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits, were formed. The Jesuits took up the call to spread the word of God, in this case, of course, the Catholic word of God, in a variety of ways. Some of them served as missionaries to areas being newly colonized by Europeans, while others founded schools in regions of Europe that were underserved or that had largely converted to one of the Protestant denominations. The founder of the Jesuits, Ignatius of Loyola, was a Spaniard who established the basic Jesuit motto, for the greater glory of God, and who took seriously this new education focus. Even today, the Jesuits are considered the best educated of the church's clergy. They are educators, doctors, lawyers, and scientists. As you might expect, the uncertainty brought about by religious reform led to fighting between both groups and states, especially as those states adopted statewide religious reforms. The Holy Roman Empire was involved in a series of wars in the middle of the 16th century and then again from 1618 to 1648. In France, there were three wars which are collectively known as the French Wars of Religion. While the fighting was sparked by religious disagreement, it was often intensified because of greed. Protestant kings fought Catholic ones in hopes that they would be able to expand their own states through the annexation of territory. In the long run, these wars were unsuccessful in that expansion, except that, eventually, Catholic Europeans did have to recognize the legal rights of the Protestant denominations in certain states. The era of Protestant Reformation was also the era of European exploration. Inevitably, the religious competition between Christian denominations that played out in Europe would also be played out in these areas which were newly visited by Europeans. The Jesuits, in particular, went out with the mission to evangelize. The Jesuits wore black robes as their habit or uniform. In both of these paintings, we see Jesuits working to convert non-Christians to Catholicism. In 1540, a Spanish Jesuit named Francis Xavier was given a mission to bring Catholicism to the peoples of the East. He traveled to the east coast of Africa and then to India, spending a lot of time there and in what is now Indonesia, converting tens of thousands of people to Catholicism. In 1549, he went to Japan and spent nearly two years there, introducing the Japanese to Christianity. Xavier would die in 1552 en route to China. The Jesuits and other orders also were sent to the Americas, where they were often the first Europeans to explore the land and interact with the various native people. Some North American groups refer to the Jesuits as the Black Robes, which points to the fact that the Jesuits traveled to them, 
rather than expecting Native Americans to come to the churches and to the missions that they founded. In bringing Catholicism to the Americas, the Spaniards also unwittingly brought about the creation of new syncretic religions, such as voodoo. Catholic beliefs mingled with those of the native peoples, and, a bit later, with the African religious traditions brought to the Americas via enslaved Africans. Native American traditions are overwhelmingly animist, as are West African traditions. Believers pray to the souls of nature and of their ancestors. These beliefs mingled with Catholic Christianity, creating a religion in which believers prayed both to their ancestor souls and to the Catholic saints. Native matriarchal structures were maintained in voodoo, as there were both priestesses and priests involved in worship. Today, voodoo is found primarily in Louisiana and in Haiti, with some practitioners in Cuba and Puerto Rico. The image you see here is of a traditional voodoo altar. Santeria is another syncretic religion that emerged as a result of a mix of Catholicism, Native American traditions, and the religious beliefs of the Yoruba people of West Africa. Unlike voodoo, Santeria is more deeply rooted in the faith of the Yoruba people. While there is some Christian crossover, Santeria believers worship the Yoruba gods, known as Orishas. Santeria emerged in Cuba first, and that is where it is still primarily practiced, although it did spread throughout the Caribbean. This is an altar for Santeria. You can note the differences and the clear Christian connotations in the voodoo altar. There are also instances where Native beliefs and Catholicism may have merged, or Native Americans may simply have learned to use Christian vocabulary to discuss their own Native religious traditions. Take, for example, these two images from Peru. On the left is an elaborately carved decoration outside of a Catholic church. It seems like just a nice design, until you notice the face at the bottom of the totem. In fact, this design denotes one of the spirits which the Inca worshipped. So was this used as a sign that this building was actually used to worship the Inca deity and not the Christian god? The image on the right is, at first glance, a very familiar one. It's the Last Supper. However, when taking a closer look, you can see that the food on the platter before Jesus is a guinea pig, a traditional holiday meal for people of the Andes. Used primarily on very special occasions, in this case, the use of the guinea pig indicates the importance of the Last Supper in the Christian tradition. It just uses Native American iconography to do that. Another example of this confusing situation arises with the role of the Aztec mother goddess Tonantzin. Here, Tonantzin is shown in a traditional way, a barefooted woman wearing a traditional Aztec dress. She's also wearing an elaborate headdress decorated with various agricultural products. Associated with the moon, Tonantzin is often shown in front of the moon or standing on a crescent moon. In early December of 1531, a Native American named Juan Diego saw several visions of a beautiful maiden who identified herself as the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, on a hill called Tepeyac, a traditional worship site for the goddess Tonantzin. Juan Diego confessed his vision to the Archbishop of Mexico, who told Juan Diego to request a miracle from this mysterious lady to prove her identity. According to Juan Diego's account, when he requested this miracle, the lady made roses bloom on Tepeyac in the middle of December. Juan Diego gathered these miraculous roses in his cloak to take back to the archbishop. However, when Juan Diego opened up his cloak, it wasn't the roses which proved the apparition, but rather the appearance of this image, seen here at left, on his cloak. This image, which is known as the Virgen de Guadalupe, is now recognized by the church as being an official apparition of the Virgin Mary in the Americas. If you look closely, though, you can see that there are interesting parallels between this image of the Virgin Mary and that of Tonantzin. First of all, the Virgen is clearly a Native American woman, very much different from images of the Virgin Mary that 16th century Europeans would be familiar with. Secondly, she stands on what appears to be a crescent moon, and she is bathed in light, perhaps from that moon? The Virgen wears traditional Aztec garments in the colors Europeans would recognize as being symbolic of the Virgin Mary, pink and blue. But these colors were also symbolic of the goddess Tonantzin. 
Notice that the blue is perhaps more appropriately a turquoise shade, turquoise, which is found in the Americas. Since that time in the 16th century, there has been extensive speculation as to whether the Native Americans who worshipped at the church built in honor of the Virgen de Guadalupe on the site of Tepeyac recognize that they are there to worship the Christian God, or whether they consider themselves to be worshipping the goddess Tonantzin, who appeared on this cloak in 1531. Finally, as Catholic missionaries were spreading around the world with the exploration movement, some Christians who were persecuted for their beliefs were choosing to leave Europe in the hopes of establishing religious colonies in the Americas. These persecuted Christians, who belonged to minority Protestant denominations for the most part, sought charters from the English government and so established their colonies in North America. In the 1620s, a group of English Calvinists known as Puritans, we call them the Pilgrims, arrived in what is now Massachusetts. They had been so heavily persecuted in England that they had initially fled to the Dutch Republic, where Calvinists were welcomed, but they had wanted to establish their own state where they could worship freely so they came to the Americas. In the early 1630s, the colony of Maryland was founded. Unlike New England, there was no initial religious requirement for the inhabitants of Maryland, but it was understood that Catholics, who were by this time persecuted in England, would not be persecuted in Maryland. While most of Maryland's settlers would initially be Protestants, Catholics were not only allowed to settle freely in Maryland, but they were able to hold political office, which was not allowed to Catholics back in England. At the end of the 1600s, the King of England granted colonial land to William Penn. Known as Pennsylvania, this land became a new home to English Quakers, who were persecuted in England, and it attracted Quakers from other parts of Europe as well. Like Maryland, Pennsylvania formally enacted religious tolerance, which allowed settlers of any religious persuasion within its borders. In this way, the age of exploration coincided with the spread of Catholic Christianity around the world, thanks to the missionary efforts of the Catholic Church, especially through the Jesuits. While various Protestant denominations were present in the Americas, Protestants in the 15th and 16th centuries did not make a strong push to convert Native Americans to Christianity. The great age of Protestant missionary activity would come in the 18th and 19th centuries with the emergence of another age, the age of imperialism. But that's a story for another day. <laughs>